Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning uh, for our cybersecurity. Happy Small Business Week. Um, my name is Carmen. I'm the Manager of Business Services here with the Chamber and happy to uh, host with Paul this morning. Uh, before I get started, I do uh, want to acknowledge that um, I find myself on the traditional lands of the Metagami and Metachewan First Nations um, in the Treaty 9 territory. Um, uh, as an organization, the Chamber does uh, uh, strive to be able to uh, make connections and relationships between nations and improve our own understanding uh, of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. Um, and uh, we always take the time in order to, um, you know, enrich our um, um, learnings of uh, history, heritage, and um, the resiliency of our First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Um, thank you for joining us this morning uh, with Paul Bruna um, of Great White North Technology Consulting for our um, session entitled Cyber Security. Um, we are uh, joined from um, those small businesses uh, from Temiskaming Shores to Kenora via our 32 uh, Northern Ontario Chambers and uh, very happy to be able to welcome Paul today. So welcome Paul, thanks for joining us. Um, if you do um, have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask Paul uh, some questions along the way. I did make sure that that was okay with him so that he wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't be upset. And uh, also if you want, you can um, key in your questions in the chat at the um, bottom of your screen as well. So Paul, the floor floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Carmen. Um, yeah, again, so uh, Paul Burnett here from Great White North Technology Consulting. Um, we're based out of Timmins, actually Schumacher now. Uh, we're in the old uh, Chamber of Commerce building, uh, which we uh, we purchased last year, around uh, August of last year. We've been renovating, so uh, it's uh, it's come along uh, quite, uh, quite, quite a ways now. Um, we're currently a team of 17 people. Uh, we provide IT services and support for organizations in Northern Ontario and Nunavut, and we've got some in, uh, in Southern Ontario as well. Uh, we've been around since 2012, so late 2012. We're just approaching our 11th year now, um, come November, December. And um, we were recently acknowledged as one of the MSP 501 winners for 2023. Um, we've had some previous successes there in uh, the prior years as well. So we are uh, what we call a managed IT service provider. So businesses kind of make sense out of technology. Um, we essentially um, help um, help organizations with all of their IT service needs um, and kind of uh, you know, from the installation of the networking hardware, the computers and ongoing IT support. Um, and um, the things here that we're going to cover today are basically how to improve your company's cybersecurity posture and just focused on five different things. So passwords and multi-factor authentication, um, keeping your devices up to date, uh, protecting all of your devices, securing your data, and then training your staff. So we'll start off with passwords. Obviously, you know, passwords have been around for a very, very long time, but there's a lot of issues with passwords, right? People tend to reuse passwords. Um, they tend to use passwords that are, um, that, that have a pattern. So like password one, password two, password three, because they're forced to um, change their password on an ongoing basis, right? So some of the best practices now that even Microsoft is, is suggesting is that you don't um, force passwords to expire because people will just use that pattern. Um, some of the things here that you could do to kind of uh, make passwords uh, more unique and more complex is a, a password manager. So password manager is basically a piece of software um, or an app that you install on your device that will assist with the creation of unique passwords and complex passwords. Um, and then it'll it'll safeguard it um, in that in that application. You could also combine a multiple uh, like multiple words um, to make it something more memorable, but still have it very complex. So for instance, if you were to combine like four different words together, um, it would be uh, significantly harder to get access than um, 
an actual password that would be like eight digits or 10 digits long. Um, enforcing password complexity is definitely something that is um, is also recommended. So by having, you know, uh, a combination of uppercase, lowercase, special characters and numbers um, is what essentially the password complexity is. And then multi-factor authentication or two-factor 2FA, MFA um, is definitely something that you want to be utilizing at this point if, um, if, if you can. And if um, the application or if the service that you have doesn't support it, then um, I would probably suggest having a look at different alternative uh, uh, programs or applications that do support it because I would say that most uh, vendors now, software vendors and security vendors have um, MFA um, enabled. Um, changing, you know, a single word with one letter changed as well. So like password with the at sign doesn't make it a strong password. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, password crackers now that will actually um, uh, change those out uh, to, to do the guessing. So um, I'm going to try to make things a little bit interesting here by throwing some memes here uh, into uh, in, into the slides because uh, I, I don't want you to be uh, bored to death here. But um, these are just a, a few here that I found that were uh, re regarding passwords I thought were kind of funny. Um, the other thing that we're starting to see more and more now are different um, uh, services or different um, uh, SaaS applications, hosted applications, line of business applications that support single sign-on. And what single sign-on allows you to do is that it allows you to log in with one single password, and then it'll pass through that authentication um, over to the application that you're using. So case in point, like in my environment here, we use um, an HR software that when I'm logged into my device, I log in with my Microsoft 365 credentials. And then when I go to the HR software, it automatically authenticates with the password that I already used. Um, so a lot of different services now support single sign-on. It's just a matter of talking to your IT team and getting it integrated. And then that just makes it a little bit easier for your staff. They only need to log in once, so they don't have to um, worry about, you know, remembering another password or um, setting up another password for, um, uh, the, you know, th those types of services or software. Um, I talked a little bit about password managers earlier on. Um, password managers are extremely, extremely powerful because it allows you to um, create unique passwords for everything. And it's kind of like having, you know, a book with all of your passwords in it, except the book is really, really safe and secure because it's encrypted and you need to have, um, you know, the the secret keys basically to get into it. So um, there's a couple different password managers there that I've listed here, like Dashlane, Keeper, 1Password, and LastPass. These password managers um, also support um, businesses, right? So in a business environment, you could have a password manager that your entire team uses, but that you can you could control at the business level to say like, you know, the accounting department has access to these set of passwords and the sales department has access to these sets of passwords. And so you can still maintain and manage that. Um, for personal use now, um, a lot of the devices that you utilize already, um, you know, in your in your daily life, like your iPhone, um, in, in my case here, I, I'm an iPhone user. And so the iPhone has a built-in password manager right into uh, the device. So the iCloud keychain synchronizes all of the passwords. Um, so the only way that you could get into it is by using your biometric, uh, you know, unlocking features, either your, you know, your face or, or your pin code. Um, and then it secures those passwords uh, for you, right? So um, th that that's also something that you could make use of uh, that doesn't really have any costs. And then an application um, like Microsoft Authenticator also has some password management features built into it. So you could utilize that piece of um, software to not only um, unlock 
with multi-factor authentication, but also to store and to ensure that your passwords are, are safely kept. Some of the features that you'll find as well when you're buying a password manager, um, there's a number of different things that they support. Um, what, one of the big ones here is the dark web monitoring. So it'll actually monitor your email address to see if your email address was um, you know, found in, in one of the latest um, breaches for a third party breach. Um, and then it'll alert you on that. So that's uh, that's kind of nice. Um, browser integration is another really nice feature. Um, so essentially, whatever web browser that you're using, um, it could install an extension or an add-in. And when you're going to a new website to go in and um, you know create a new account for something, it'll pre-populate that or it'll remember what it is that you're typing in and it'll store it into uh, the password manager. Um, and it will generate a password based on whatever complexity requirements that you set in there. A couple other features like, you know, built-in VPN. So if you're getting connected from like a coffee shop, an airport, or as you're traveling, you get connected to a VPN and just secures your traffic. Um, you could share passwords within the password manager securely instead of emailing um, through, uh, you know, just your regular email, right? You would never really want to send a password or any sensitive information through email. Um, so <laughs> here, here's another quick one here. So adding an extra exclamation mark at the end um, doesn't make a password manager. Uh, I mean, doesn't make a password secure. You're better off to use a password manager. Um, the things here that we're starting to see now with, you know, new technologies. So there's a lot of um, um, talk about passwordless authentication, right? So passwords kind of going off to the wayside where now you'll be able to authenticate either with a pass key, um, which is a, a secure certificate that's stored on your device um, or an actual piece of hardware like a FIDO2 key, um, which will essentially... Um, allow you to get logged into a device without providing a password. And the graph that I have here just basically shows that it's high security and it's ultra convenient for, for people. Um, whereas, you know, setting up like a password with the two-factor authentication, um, I'm sure you've all seen it over the last little while when, you know, you're getting set up with your multi-factor. It's a little bit of, it's a little bit of a learning curve and you know, people tend to push back a little bit. So the passwordless authentication really makes that easy. Um, you can do passwordless authentication already with Microsoft 365. Um, the reason why I kind of, I'm going back to Microsoft 365 here, because that's what we chose as our standard uh, within our company. And I would say about 95% of our clients also use Microsoft 365. So. Um, if you haven't already done it, um, Microsoft has the Authenticator app, which is actually pretty great. And within the Authenticator app, you could actually go in and you could set up the passwordless authentication. So when you go to sign in to your Microsoft 365 account, essentially all you have to do is put in your email address and then it'll pop up on your screen um, uh, that uh, you know it sent a message over to your Authenticator app and you just have to approve it on your Authenticator app to get logged in. Any questions so far? Looking good. All right, so we've got multi-factor authentication here. So again, you know, I don't wanna to go too much into details here what multi-factor is. I'm sure that most people already know. It's just a second factor of authentication, right? So it's typically, you know, something that you know something that you have and something that you're in, in, in possession of. So uh, something that, you know, like a password or a pin code, something that you have is either like a security key or smartphone and something that you are is like your fingerprint or your facial recognition, right? Your biometrics. So not all multi-factor solutions are equal, um, but every single one uh, improves the overall um, cybersecurity posture of an organization, right? So, um, you know, years ago, multi-factor authentication was really focused on like sending you like a text message, right? Text message now is going to be less secure because um, a lot of uh, third parties, when they really want to get into something, they'll go the extra mile by um, impersonating you and 
uh, resetting, you know, your your cell phone provider's uh, account to go and generate a new SIM card and an activated device, uh, and then intercept that text message. So it's uh, it's an extreme case, but it happens all the time. Um, why should you use uh, multi-factor? Well, it minimizes the risks associated with password theft. So stuff like phishing attempts, uh, credential stuffing, which is essentially, you know, what we've seen recently in the news with the 23andMe breach. Basically, um, you know, your passwords that were found on the dark web for some other services that you utilize and um, those credentials get um, utilized to try to log into a, a, a specific service. So um, in the case for 23andMe, um, you know, with, with uh, the different email accounts that are associated with your logins and the passwords, when people reuse the same password, they basically just take those credentials and try to log into different websites. So um, it's not necessarily that the website that was, uh, you know, low security or that their uh, passwords were actually breached or their databases were breached. Um, it's It was just a legitimate login, right? So for people that didn't have um, multi-factor authentication uh, enabled. And then obviously brute force attacks. So these are like computers and bots and whatnot that are um, just trying to guess passwords um, from either a list of passwords or it just alternates really, really fast through um, the different possibilities. So obviously the longer that your password is, uh, the more secure it is. And um, obviously if it's unique, then that makes it a lot harder, but all of these, you know, multi-factors really what will prevent it from, um, uh, sorry, will prevent the um, third party hacker from getting into the system. So another meme here, uh, multi-factor, nice and strong, you know, password one, two, three, not so strong. There are different types of devices that you could utilize as well. Like I mentioned, you know, the app that you see here on that iPhone, is um, like a Microsoft Authenticator app and you could add multiple services to that where it'll generate a new code or it'll push a notification to you. There's a lot of hardware tokens. So those USB keys that you see, those are called UB keys um, where essentially you have to have that plugged into your device or touch your um, mobile device or any device that supports uh, NFC uh, to do it wirelessly. You have to push the little button on there and when you utilize that key, you have to put in uh, a pin code, right? So it's multiple factors of authentication. Obviously, um, you know, these types of devices make things a lot harder to break in. Um, you can even get, you know, some apps now on your on your um, Apple Watch or on your smart watch, which makes it a lot easier when you're going to log in. Um, a couple of things, you know, how do you enable multi-factor authentication, typically um, you'll find it under like a settings and privacy section or sign in and security uh, for pretty much any service that you use nowadays, um, including, you know, social media, including your own personal email um, in an enterprise application or like in, in a, you know, a business environment in the SMB world, what you really want to do is you want to coordinate what that's going to look like. Um, because there's a lot of people that are involved and the, there's different skill set as well, right? So if you if you enable this wrong, uh, it could create a lot of confusion. It could create a lot of um, uh, issues with people trying to log in to different services. You really have to um, coordinate this and plan it with your, your IT team. So typically what we do is we create a, you know, um, a campaign here and we make sure that everybody uh, is involved with, we'll have a look at, you know, what uh, different services are, are involved, what will get impacted. We'll typically start off with the top level admin accounts and then the key um, um, people in an organization, like business owners, CFO, CEO, leaders, uh, senior, senior leadership and whatnot. And then we'll plan for, um, you know, deployment for the rest of the team. So you got to look at really, um, a number of different things to make sure that um, legacy applications and whatnot that still uh, authenticate to whatever application that you're using that's not broken. Um, and then obviously, you know, you want to make sure that 
uh, you're there to support um, when you do go live, make sure that uh, you're you're able to um, address any issues that uh, that happen. This is a quick link here to the um, Office 365 on how to just enable it on your own Office 365. Typically, what we do is we take it a step further and we set um, conditional access policies, which just enforces multi-factor across the organization. So it's not just saying, hey, you know, go into your own Office 365 user, set this, and then we'll be good, right? Because anybody new that starts, um, they have the potential to not enable it. Whereas when we're setting up a conditional access policy, it really uh, enforces that. A lot of the computers now um, have built-in multi-factor authentication. So this is essentially just um, a screenshot from Windows Hello for Business. This is built into your computer. So you can do stuff like facial recognition, fingerprint recognition, the pin codes. Um, you could pair again, like those UB keys or the security keys that, that, that I've showed. Another kind of nice feature is the dynamic lock. So it'll just pair with your phone's Bluetooth. And as you walk away from your computer, it'll lock your computer. So these are all things that are available right now that uh, organizations could be um, utilizing to improve their cybersecurity posture. Cybersecurity uh, training. So this is a huge one, right? Um, a lot of organizations now are asking for this. In, in, in my world here, I'm getting um, requests for this all the time because of the different cybersecurity insurance requirements, um, compliancy for different organizations and for um, you know the, the, the industries that they're in. Um, the security awareness training used to be like really, really boring uh, and people didn't like doing it. Um, it's gotten much better. Um, there are different little micro training sessions um, that, uh, that, that make things interesting for people. They really helps them understand kind of the current types of threats that exist because as you could imagine, you know, the cybersecurity landscape is changing daily. Um, so with new types of threats that come out, there's new um, training modules that come out um, to, uh, to, to, to help uh, train people on, on how to identify those, those types of threats. Um, they've also like gamified it. So there's um, an employee secure score that you could actually see. Uh, so you could, you know, publish uh, those scores, a dashboard within the office to show, you know, who's got the highest score and, and people tend to get a little bit more motivated when, um, uh, you know, you've, you've gamified something. Um, it, there's also the um, yearly training modules. So on a, on a yearly basis, there's essentially another security training that the employees do have to um, uh, complete. And that's really what allows you to check off that box in that cybersecurity questionnaire. And then throughout um, you know, the year, there's also the phishing simulations where um, it'll send uh, uh, simulated phishing attempts for you know, Amazon packages, uh, you know, online banking, um, those types of things, right? That are that are real threats within, you know, our 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 area here, um, and it helps you identify those and how to report them. Um, like I mentioned before, the dark web monitoring. So uh, typically, a security awareness training platform will have dark web monitoring also, where you could see, you know, a list of uh, the user accounts uh, in your organization that have been breached. Um, so you kind of uh, assess that and see, um, you know, if anything needs to be done and it does ongoing monitoring for that as well. So if there's a new breach that comes out and, you know, one of your uh, employees' email addresses are in there, um, it has the potential to send you an email with an alert and then identify, you know, what's the next best thing to do is if we need to go and roll that password, um, if that password is also shared. Um, and the platform that we utilize for this actually shows us all of the different um, email accounts that have been breached. And you could see what um, type of information was released in that breach. So it's uh, extremely powerful and um, it really helps to train your staff to really make sure that, um, you know, they become kind of like a human firewall, right? Because you could have all the best security in the world, 
And if, you know, you open up the door for somebody, you invite them in and you give them access to everything within your organization, um, you know, it's, it, it's not, it's not a good thing. So <laughs> just a quick one here for security awareness training. So I'm sure that everybody's kind of seen, uh, you know, the cyber uh, yeah, emails that come in to say, hey, you know, it's the boss or it's it's pretending to be the boss and, hey, you know, can you go get some some gift cards for me? I, I'm in a meeting or whatever. Can you just do it and expense it and everything's going to be okay? Um, I've seen I've seen this this type of email come in, that type of phishing attempt come in. And then for the folks that are already doing security awareness training, you know, the, the other meme here is just like, hmm, I wonder if I should click on this, right? They become hyper vigilant on on the things that they should and shouldn't click on. Um, the dark web monitoring, I'll go into it a little bit more essentially. Um, you know, what 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 should you do if your email has been listed in a breach, right? Well, obviously, you know, if if you have an idea of, you know, where it came from and then what type of information came from that breach, not every single breach will uh, include, you know, a password breach, right? It might just be, access to some of the information that you put in there, maybe some, um, you know, addresses, uh, contact information, hopefully not, you know, any financial information. But um, if, um, you know, if your your uh, account has been breached or in, in any way, it's always good to change your password. Um, if you use that password for other um, logins, you should change it basically across the board and that's you know tying back you know the password manager into this a password manager is extremely useful because it'll it will show you you know if that password has been reused right so you can go and you could roll that across the board um you can also you should also take additional steps if financial data was breached so you may want to review your credit report and whatnot I can make these slides available at um, at the end as well. These are just a couple different websites um, that will do some dark web monitoring for you. So um, feel free to you, you know sign up on those uh, to just go and see if if you're part of a, a breach. Some of them are limited; they may not show you the password that was breached and whatnot, but still uh, good to identify that. Um, securing data. Uh, is the next section here. And so um, data within your environment, um, you want to make sure that it's properly stored on your devices. And so encryption is is a huge uh, uh, factor here, making sure that that data is secure. So if your device, for instance, your laptop is encrypted, um, then if it were to get stolen, then you would need the um, encryption key to unlock that data, right? So, you know, your password is basically what allows you to get into your laptop, but the encryption is um, at the file system level. So if you were to use like a USB um, a boot up key and try to go in and change the password so that, you know, you get access to the data that's on it, if the data is encrypted, you have to decrypt the data before you could go in and change the password. So everything stays safe. So uh, we strongly recommend that laptops get encrypted and that, um, you know, uh, any, any high risk devices also get encrypted. So if you have some desktop computers in your organization, more and more companies now are encrypting just everything. Um, you want to make sure that those encryption keys are safely stored and secured. There's a number of different ways of doing that. You could even integrate some of those um, encryption keys and like Microsoft 365 if, um, if it's set up correctly. Um, so in terms of like the Windows world, the encryption is called BitLocker. On the Mac side, it's called File Vault, but both of them um, make it very simple. You know, you could go in and enable it and it'll ask you to save the key um, and then you're good to go. If you lose the encryption key, your data is locked forever. So that's the that's the downside to encryption. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a good uh, a good documentation policy. Backup and uh, disaster recovery. 
Um, really, you know, every organization is different and, you know, what, what you want to consider when thinking about backup and data and disaster recovery is really what your recovery time objective and your recovery point objective is. So you want to ask yourself, like, how quickly do I need to recover from, um, you know, this data loss, right? What's, what's your cost of downtime? You know, going through that exercise and figuring out, hey, you know, if I'm down for an hour, it's maybe not catastrophic. But if I'm down for an entire day, that's like thousands of dollars, or it could be tens of thousands of dollars, or it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And so your backup uh, strategy would be different, and your disaster recovery strategy would be different in that case. Um, but really, you know, that's th those are some of the things that you want to consider. And ideally, you know, a good backup solution would have multiple backups throughout the day. And this, you know, we're, we're talking about like a data type backup, right? For, um, you know, storing your files, maybe your accounting software and whatnot um, on your computers, um, on your servers, if you still have any. And, um, uh, you know, another thing that is also extremely important is that the backups are validated and verified. So, um, you know, back back in the day, you used to have your backup jobs run and maybe it would send an email if the backup failed, but it was kind of like a set it and forget it. And then you would realize, hmm, you know what, it hasn't backed up in the last month. And that's typically, you know, when you're going to try to restore something. So um, a lot of the newer backup solutions have automation built in where it'll validate that it's a good backup. It'll start it up and it's kind of, own little virtual environment, make sure that it's successful, that you could restore from it, right? So it does that validation for you. Um, ideally, you want to have your backups go off site. You want to make sure they're encrypted. You want to make sure that in order to access your backups, um, you have um, uh, multi-factor to protect um, that actual backup solution. And you want to make sure it's that that the storage that it's on, it can't go and get deleted, right? So typically, when a hacker comes in, they will uh, go in and trash the backups uh, if they're trashable, and um, then trash the system. And you know, if you have your backups kind of secured the same way that you have your system secured or on the same network, um, that could be really catastrophic. The really important thing with, with uh, securing your data is you have to be able to identify what data it is that you're trying to protect, right? Not all the data is on your server. Um, you know, some people have data on their local computer. Some people have data in Dropbox. Some people have data in a number of different third-party online storage, SharePoint, OneDrive. I mean, the list goes on, right? So you need to determine where your organizational data is um, how it's being backed up, how it's being secured. Is it compliant? Um, you know, a lot of the different uh, regulations for, um, you know, the, the, that, that organizations are faced with here, you can't store credit card numbers. So if you're storing credit card numbers, you know, in Dropbox, that's, that's not good, right? So um, you need to have some policies and you have to think of like organizational policies to, determine, you know, how you're going to safeguard that data, where it's going to reside, and then how you're going to protect it. So you can't protect data if you don't know where it is. Um, so cloud data, again, you know, around the Microsoft 365, um, you know, there's SharePoint data, there's OneDrive data, there's Teams data. Obviously, your emails is also another type of data. How do you safeguard that data? Um, Microsoft has a shared responsibility model where they'll provide you the platform. They're responsible for the platform itself. They're not responsible for the data that you have within the platform. So um, it's it's extremely, extremely important that, you, you know, as an organization, you're thinking of how you're going to back that up, um, how you're going to safeguard that information. Um, time and time again, you know, we come across different Microsoft 365 tenants for clients or potential clients, and they've got their own structure that, you know, somebody in the organization went and created 
Um, and it could actually be very dangerous because a user can expose corporate data on, you know, just a vanilla Microsoft 365 tenant that hasn't been configured, right? Um, and th that is a risk because you could share externally, you could share potentially data that, um, you know, should not be published externally. So you really need to create policies, train staff, make sure it's properly set up from the top down. A lot of discussions with management to determine which, you know, security groups, where the data is going to go. And then, um, you know, what are some of the other things to consider? Maybe, you know, redirect some of the uh, local folders on a user's desktop, for instance, or their documents or their photos to go into like OneDrive and then um, have it synchronized there. So if their computer uh, uh, fails, it's just a matter of setting up a new computer, they would have access to all of the data that they would uh, typically have in their OneDrive. So this is um, a quick slide here just to show you the shared responsibility model with Microsoft. So these are some of the things that Microsoft are responsible for and the customer uh, is responsible for, you know, the information, the data, the devices, you know, the um, accounts, uh, safeguarding the accounts, right? I mean, if you don't have multi-factor authentication and somebody gets in, is it Microsoft's fault or is it your fault, right? Well, it's definitely your fault. Now, organizations are starting to enforce multi-factor um, at, at a higher level now. Um, so typically, you know, new accounts that you're creating within Microsoft 365, like a new tenant, if you were to sign up today, there'd be some of those multi-factor authentications as a requirement. But the, the ones that are older that don't have it enabled, um, they haven't been enforced yet across the board. Protecting the devices now. So obviously, you know, your servers, all of your computers, your laptops, that sort of stuff. You want to make sure that you use a layered approach to security. And so what we do here at Grey White North for our clients, we make sure that uh, there's um, a number of different agents on the device, which protects it for malware, for ransomware, for different types of breaches. And so we utilize an EDR software, it's managed, which basically allows um, a device to properly uh, get secured. And if a breach does happen, so if a hacker does get in, or if there's a piece of software that gets installed that is actually malicious and starts encrypting files, um, it'll identify that right away and um, it'll actually isolate it from the rest of the network. So um, typically, you know, we see these types of things happen in the middle of the night on a long weekend. Hackers don't sleep, right? So when you're sleeping, that's when they're working. And that's the, you know, that's their way of making the most damage without getting uh, caught, right? We also utilize... Um, advanced DNS threat protection. So that is essentially um, for outbound threats. So if, for instance, you're going to a website and the website's malicious, when you're browsing to that website, um, it'll get blocked, right? Um, Real-time privilege management is also a really good one. It, it you know, is getting closer to the zero, zero trust security. So, you know, how often have you come across you know, a computer in an organization where the user could just install whatever piece of software on it, right? I mean, that's the easiest way to do it. I would say most organizations, that's what they do. But typically when you run across a piece of malicious software, it will not ask you to install it and click next and agree to the terms and conditions. It'll just install silently on the computer. With real-time privilege management, um, only a list of authorized software could run on the computer, could install on the computer. And anytime there's something that deviates from that list, um, there's a prompt that comes up and it'll communicate back. Um, in our case here with our clients, it communicates back with our team. It automatically opens up a ticket. It pops up on our mobile devices. We could review it and we could approve it either the one time for the device, for that organization or for all of our clients. And so that still gives people the ability to install things without actually having administrative privileges to just install anything. Um, and that works really, really well in kind of a layered approach to security. Obviously the Microsoft and third-party patches are also equally important. So 
um, all of your devices, it's extremely, extremely important to keep them up to date um, and current with the latest security updates. Checking mobile devices uh, is as equally important and organizations that do utilize uh, mobile devices um, tend to utilize a mobile device management software and MDM software in short. That um, could mean a number of different things. You could set different policies. You could um, set, you know, the, the device could join these wireless networks and have the wireless network already pre-programmed in. You could uh, publish applications for your staff um, instead of getting them to, you know, sign in with their own personal like Apple ID to go and download like the Outlook app in order to be able to read, you know, corporate emails. Um, so it allows, you know, your organization to to deploy these things without requiring the end user to go in and, um, you know, log in with their Apple ID and um, and download those applications themselves. It could enforce different device profiles like having a pin lock or biometric lock. Um, it allows the organization to also ensure that those devices are up to date. So you could have different policies that will prevent you from doing certain things until you've updated your device. Um, obviously, geolocking and uh, geolocation and blocking is, is also extremely important because if a device does get locked or if a device does go somewhere that it shouldn't uh, go, it potentially could be stolen. Um, and so, um, you know, the mobile device management has the ability to uh, wipe that device or to wipe the sensitive information off that device which is extremely, extremely useful. All of this, you know, training new users, making sure that they understand, you know, at what point they need to notify the organization if, you know, they've misplaced their device or if their vehicle has been broken into and the device has been stolen. Um, obviously, you know, you want to make sure that um, the organization is made aware of uh, very quickly so that action could be taken. Um, networking devices are also as equally important. So networking devices includes like your firewall, your network switches, your wireless access points, all of the stuff that basically allows you to get connected to be able to do your day-to-day -day stuff within the office or remotely. So it's extremely important to keep those devices updated as well. Um, there's usually a number of different IoT, Internet of Things devices like security cameras and thermostats and all of this other fun stuff now in the world that we live in that make our lives a lot easier, those also need to be considered. Um, you should segregate your network. So you should have all of those devices on the same network. You should have um, segregation to uh, carve out, you know, different portions of your network where the different IoT devices that may be less secure, they could, uh, you know, live on that portion of the network. Make sure that um, you know you're 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 compartmentalizing the network so that if there is a breach on one of the components, that it doesn't spread and affect the rest of the network. Um, firewall ports is something that you know we're seeing uh, as an issue, and it's been an issue for a number of years. Where hey, you know, if you have uh, somebody or or something that you need to access remotely, well, you typically have to open up you know, something in the firewall to be able to get access to that from the outside, right? That's where, you know, a number of different external vulnerabilities come in, especially when something hasn't been fully patched. Um, it, there's a number of different websites out there like Shodan and a number of, of, of other websites that will expose those vulnerabilities for everybody to see. So it's a matter of just putting in your IP address on the website. It'll show you the different vulnerabilities that exist, which ports are open. And so you want to really minimize your risk by not opening up um, uh, ports in your firewall. There are a number of different ways now that we could, you know, get access to those um, services or those uh, devices uh, from a remote location, right? So VPNs, you know, we hear about VPNs all the time. Um, VPNs could actually be a huge uh, risk, right? Because uh, there's so many vulnerabilities, again, that come out for the firewalls that run these VPNs. 
you want to make sure that those stay up to date. And when you can, if you can go to a zero trust networking model, then you don't have to open up those ports. Um, do you utilize the uh, advanced features within your firewalls as well? As well because it will do stuff like geo-blocking. It will do int intrusion detection prevention just to block those known risks. Um, one of the other things here, oh, I just clicked the wrong one. So one of the other things is uh, on the wireless network. So um, we like to have a separate wireless network for guests. Um, and the guest wireless network, how we configure it is just as fast um, as the regular wireless network. We could set different um, bandwidth profiles, but typically a guest wireless network will do guest isolation or device isolation. So when you get connected to that network, you essentially have access to the internet, but you don't have access to do kind of everything that you want to do on the network, access network resources like the server or printers or other network devices. Um, so we typically um, configure those and we tell people with mobile devices, yeah, just get connected to the guest network. Um, if they need to access stuff like printers and servers, then uh, the, we typically have that set up on um, the corporate laptop um, that, that, that could access that uh, specific wireless network. Just to kind of like recap on all of this here and some of the best practices and tips, things that you should be doing if you're not already doing. So again, you know, multi-factor, if you don't have multi-factor enabled, enable it now, um, enable it on your personal devices, on your, your social media, your LinkedIn, because all of these things here are all risks, right? Um, if there's a breach and they're able to get, you know, into your emails, your social media, your applications, it could be catastrophic. Try not to reuse passwords, make sure your systems are up to date. So your computers, your servers, your networking devices, your mobile devices, you know, um, Apple and, you know, Android, when they release something, uh, it's typically because it's, it's fixing a zero day vulnerability uh, or something that is, is pretty critical. It's not just always a feature update or, you know, a patch to fix a bug on, on the device. There's, it's a cat and mouse game. So hackers are finding new ways to come in and, uh, you know, manufacturers and software providers are essentially having to catch up all the time. Invest in security awareness training for your team. Um, make sure that they're continuing it continuously trained, right? Uh, that there's modules that, uh, you know, th they need to look at on a monthly basis. Some of these training modules are very short, you know, a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes, uh, keeps it uh, nice and simple and uh, easy, to, e easy to navigate. Uh, you want to use a layered approach to securing your devices. And again, you know, making sure that there's multiple pieces in place so that if one fails, the other will catch it. Um, figuring out where your data is stored, what's important and how to properly secure it and back it up. Making sure that your software or your Microsoft 365 is properly configured is, is a huge one. Um, there's a number of different settings in Microsoft 365 that out of the box don't make it very secure. Uh, utilize dark web monitoring, use a password manager, don't share sensitive information through email. Um, this is a big one. Like I see people sending credit cards and even like hotel forms, you know, when I'm trying to uh, reserve a hotel reservation that I have to provide, you know, authorization to utilize a credit card, they want me to email that back and forth. You know, I choose not to do that, knowing that, you know, sending an email is kind of like sending a postcard, right? Um, so I, I would suggest don't, don't do that. Um, perform ongoing network vulnerability tests. So there's, um, you know, software that will run on your network to assess kind of if you have any vulnerabilities and then if your organization could afford it, or if your organization is mandated to do it, penetration testing. So third party to basically do a, a scan on your network and try to break into it uh, with permission, of course. 
backup, backup, backup. I can't say I can't say that enough. Uh, make sure that you have multiple backups uh, using like a three, two, one. So your original, your on-site backup, and then the off-site backup. Um, create a disaster recovery plan, and also an IT roadmap is as equally important. So what we like to do with our clients is just have a look at the whole picture, um, understand what is in place, and then make a plan for the next year to say, you know, in the next three months, we would like to achieve this, we would like to do that. Next six months, we would like to replace, you know, this dated hardware, um, so that everybody's all on the same page, they see the whole picture, right? And obviously work with an IT expert. Um, we could make a lot of this stuff seem a lot more simple uh, and, uh, and and make things kind of more streamlined and, and simplify it for you. There's, uh, in closing here, I have just a link to um, the baseline cybersecurity controls for small and medium organizations. So this is the... Um, it was the uh, CIO Strategy Council, which has since been renamed to the uh, Digital Governance Council. It's basically a not-for-profit corporation um, that has basically shaped and influenced the Canadian information uh, and technology ecosystem. So they've come up with a number of different uh, requirements uh, and recommendations for businesses on how to secure their IT systems. And I've got essentially um, just the table of contents, just so you could kind of glance at it. Um, these are some of the recommendations here and the things that they kind of look at, right? So for small businesses, um, how to how to properly make sure that, um, that that you're protected. And so that's the QR code for the website. These are kind of like the framework that they've put in place, and um, we're going to start seeing over the next few years. Um, a bigger push for organizations to have, you know, some uh, requirements to do this, especially in the cybersecurity insurance world, um, to make sure that they're properly secured. Any questions on any of this? Yeah. Actually, I have a little bit. Um, I work in the Timmins Public Library, so I'm just sort of seeing here. We, Of course, a lot of our security is looked after by the city of Timmins, but one of the things is we work with the public a lot. And how do you sort of get buy-in? Because we have, in, even in the work environment, you know, separate generations and some of the older generations may have a hard time. Like when you're talking things like you say, you know, something where it's compromised, you know, if somebody's trolling or they're hacking, um, you want to say docs, all this vernacular sometimes is lost on people when we're talking, or we have a lot of senior citizens come in, my colleagues, and we're trying to assist with a piece of technology, and they have a two-factor authentication, and they've lost the other device, or it's since changed. Um, how do we get that, you know, make, I guess, a user-friendly buy-in on the security? Yeah, and I mean, that, that's that's a huge challenge. I know that, like, you know, even in, like, the Apple world, right, like, how how often do you see somebody is like oh i can't download this app because i don't remember my apple id and my password right. and so a lot of it is education a lot of it is just circling back to you know the password managers stressing the importance of a password manager to keep track of all of this information i know a lot of people very close to me that anytime time they're going to log into something logging into a website they're doing like a password reset or they have like a pattern to their passwords, right? The pattern to your password makes it more secure than using the same password. However, if you look at a data breach or if you look at a platform that shows you in plain text what those passwords are, it's very, very, very simple to figure out the pattern. Like, okay, I'm changing you know, the first letter of the password to match the letter of the website. And then I'm just changing this number or I'm adding, you know, I'm changing one little thing about the password to make it unique. Um, it's it's extremely, extremely uh, simple for somebody who's really doing like a targeted attack to, to be able to get in, right? So um, I think, you know, the biggest thing is education, um, uh, a proper planning, um, and then utilizing some of the newer technology that's coming out, like the password list, like the pass keys, right? That makes it a lot easier now to do multi-factor without actually having to go in and set up, you know, a separate 
uh, piece of software, you have to go into this software, you have to get this code, you have to put it in. Um, the, the whole password list thing, I think will have a big impact on um, how we do things, how we log into things on, on a daily basis. It's, it's already starting to kind of roll out. Um, I have a lot of services that are using uh, the password list, but it's not as common as just standard multi-factor where you're scanning the QR code and then you're adding it on your device and then you're going in putting in that six digit key every time you go to log in. Um, well, I, I, what I would like to see, I would like to see more workshops, you know, for seniors, for people um, on how to properly, you know, utilize multi-factor authentication uh, in your day-to-day -day life. And I think that, you know, would, uh, would have a big impact, especially on, you know, seniors and, and whatnot. Definitely something I'm going to suggest to my colleagues. And I know I, some of the people I used to work in the reference department. Now I'm the head of technical support and systems here at the library, but people that have seen me from past are like, when are you going to bring back some programs for seniors on computers? And it's like, yeah, definitely an ongoing uh, concern. Definitely. Definitely. It's, uh, it's important across the board, right? Not just in business, but also in the personal, you know, in your own, in your own world um, for pretty much everything that you do, uh, you want to try to minimize, you know, the risk, right? Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Thank you. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing uh, that we could also do is for any organization that is interested in kind of um, having a look at where they stand on the dark web, we could do a, a free dark web scan uh, that will show you essentially the list of email addresses for your company domain. Um, as well as, you know, what type of information was um, was uh, a compromised and then the passwords as well, like the list of passwords that have been compromised. You could see a pattern to it. You could see, you know, people utilizing the same passwords. Uh, obviously, you know, the older that a domain is, the the more susceptible to, uh, you know, breach that, uh, that they are. I would say probably 90% of the businesses that, that are listening to this right now probably have some type of um, breached account on the dark web. And uh, for that, you just feel free to reach out to me and Carmen will uh, we'll be able to provide the information there, but uh, that's not a sales thing. It's just, uh, you know, I, I'm willing to go through that with you uh, and, and provide you with that information. So you have an idea of what's out there on your organization. And then finally, these are just some of the sources. Again, if you um, if, if you reach out to Carmen, I'd be willing to pass out these slides uh, for reference as well. So that's great. If you send over the um, slide deck, just even in PDF format, I'll attach it with the recording for today's session. Thanks, Paul. Perfect. And I was I was going to mention Neonet too has a number of different uh, training and sessions, and I know they're working on developing some programming for some of the training that uh, Karina that you you mentioned. So um, if you connect with MJ, I know she's uh, has some stuff in the works because um, they're getting the same kind of feedback. They need some help. So yeah, no, absolutely. Any other questions for Paul? Well, Paul, I learned some things. I'm I'm a little more afraid than I was um, at uh, ten fifty nine <laughs> this morning. But no, and I think you know, I'm, I'm, like a number of the things that you mentioned, um, you know, have either um, you know some of the phishing scams come to us as uh, an organization regularly. Uh, we've been caught in a few of them, and uh, yeah, so it's just a matter of you know for us um, mentioning all of these things when you onboard a new employee employee and making sure that that's on your checklist with all of the other things that you need to get from them. But, you know, some of the training um, also in, includes, um, you know, being um, cautious of what emails are coming in and what you're clicking on and, you know, ask questions and those types of things. So thanks, Paul. I think that we all learned um, a lot of things today and we're going to take a lot of those things back to our teams and see how we can implement and make sure that our businesses and organizations are safer. So um, I will send out the recording um, as well as the slide deck. So thanks, Paul, for that. Thanks for building this presentation for us. And uh, 
Um, happy Small Business Week to all of you. There's still some programming uh, available today uh, and tomorrow if you visit the Chamber calendar. Uh, and otherwise, um, yeah, follow follow Great White North um, on social in order to be able to, to see some tips and tricks um, and uh, the Chamber as well. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye now.